In the year 2020, I started a podcast about movies. Some episodes occasionally focused on other media as well. As I dealt with threatening interdimensional beings, I eventually met my other self from another universe where all the stuff I talked about got delayed. As it turns out, the stories as me and my guests described them were presented very differently in that other universe. So I continued podcasting these recaps, which apparently sound like improvised reviews, to entertain listeners of that other universe while they waited for the new release dates. Some episodes even focused on content of years past that did not come out in that other universe for whatever reason. The year is 2022. The podcast is now bi-weekly, unless stated otherwise. My name is Steven Schinder, and you're listening to Delayed Replay. Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of Delayed Replay, that podcast where we talk about movies that got delayed in that other universe but came out in our universe, or... In this case, movies that came out in this universe but got forgotten, whereas they didn't come out at all in that other universe. It's really weird, but we'll get into that. So first up, introductions are in order. You may have heard him in previous seasons. This is his season three appearance on this episode. It is Keon from Decorative Vegetable. What you been dreaming, man? Hey, what have I been dreaming? Uh, that's a good question. I have some pretty wild dreams, so we don't need to get into it. I, <laughs> I could go on for a long time. Yeah, I mean, it's I guess it's fitting, I guess, that we're talking about Men in Black. Um, it's sort of a very action-packed uh, movie. My dreams are usually similarly action-packed, um, usually fall under the action, suspense, or thriller genres. That but yeah, sounds good to very be back exciting. On. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my dreams are pretty exciting, not gonna lie. But yeah, no, thanks for uh, having me back on, Stephen. Pleasure to be joining you for this episode. Yeah, for sure. So, yeah, well, you mentioned it just now. We're talking about Men in Black, but it's actually the Men in Black, which some people may have forgotten because of the memory erasing feature, but it came out in 1995, so before the Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones one. And since it didn't do so well at the box office and they figured they could just reboot it with people forgetting about it. It's kind of fitting. I think you mentioned Space Jam 2 on one of your podcasts and then me and my friend Zach did an episode on it. And in that same episode, Zach mentioned that we have 10 Men in Black movies and then now I have you on this. It's kind of like weird symmetry, I guess. Mm -hmm. Sort of all coming together is the perfect storm. I mean, Space Jam does align with like the Men in Black franchise overall, just in <laughs> its commitment to memory erasing features. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that it does. Um, so this version was directed by Les Mayfield, and this was like before his Miracle on 34th Street remake, I guess, came out. Like they approached him, and it was kind of rushed. And then after they saw his movie, they kind of regretted having him on, but it was, like, too late by then. Yeah, um, couldn't pull the plug. <laughs> you couldn't, couldn't, uh, couldn't ax him at that point, I guess. Right, yeah. For the main roles, they got Clint Eastwood to play Agent K. Uh, not gonna lie, I sometimes get K and J mixed up, but yeah, he oh, plays, yeah. like, the I, I older. Do as well. That was my biggest, like fear coming onto this episode is that I was going to just stumble over J and K for the entire thing. Yeah, that must have been <laughs> hard when like you and Dylan covered Men in Black on Triple Play. <laughs> mm -hmm. That it was. So he plays Agent K here, and for Agent J, they considered Chris O'Donnell and um, also David Schwimmer, and I guess because each of them were kind of busy with certain things, they tried to figure out a way to get them both as the character it was really weird but what we'll get into that generally what what are your impressions of the men in black movies um at least the ones that you remember like what you remember of them yeah that, that's a good question um i watched you know the other the, the i guess the more well-known ones 
um, a couple years ago. And I sort of only remember the broad strokes. I mean, I liked them. I just didn't have a, a, a I didn't have too positive an impression of them. Um, I didn't think they were bad by any means. And we were also discussing like before we started recording like uh, the original Men in Black comics. They're sort of more broad than like what the franchise has become, you know, because they deal with other supernatural occurrences. Whereas like the I guess the trilogy, you know, the ones people are the most familiar with, you know, the 1997, 2002, 2012 ones are more just focused on like aliens. Oh, they do incorporate time travel as well. Yeah, the time travel made the third one my favorite of those ones in particular. Those ones focus more on aliens, whereas apparently the comics have like aliens and supernatural things. So it's like you're really limiting the creatives of those films after this one, uh, which very quickly, my impressions of the Men in Black movies was that like, yeah, they're they're good, but sometimes I don't remember like the whole picture or whatever. I think my brother is probably more um, into the Men in Black movies than I am. But yeah, so this one does include supernatural stuff in it, which makes it really different from like the ones that people remember best. Uh, I I guess we'll just start by like mentioning how like uh, Agent J gets involved. So and when he's first introduced, he's played by Chris O'Donnell. Uh, what did you think of how he got involved with all this? You know, I wasn't expecting like a, uh, a, yeah, like we were just talking about, since the other movies have such a dedication to aliens, um, I wasn't really expecting this one to kind of go ham with like, yeah, just other, I guess, supernatural or uh bordering fantasy creatures like the chupacabra that kind of just came out of nowhere um literally i mean it was a jump scare right so yeah like he was just going about his day uh like writing up some parking tickets and then all of a sudden a chupacabra pops up and it's like whoa and it's kind of part practical effects but part gross looking cgi for that um I'm trying to remember what serial it was where like there's this like really weird looking mascot that looks like a furry hedgehog or something. It's like I, I remember it was honeycomb cereal, like the weird looking mascot thing that they had for that. Um but yeah, I can't point say I'm familiar with it, but alright. It's fine. <laughs> alright, yeah, but point is that like the effects for the chupacabra kind of look dodgy to me at times. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, yeah. Like, I don't know. What'd you think of like how much screen time it got in this and like how effective was it overall? Yeah. I mean, uh, aside from the initial jump scare, like I said, I was kind of surprised at the dedication to like this sort of uh, things like in that direction of the chupacabra and just like other cryptids and other things like that, where it's like, the excessive amount of screen time, I think, um, compared with like the yeah, like you said, exactly dodgy effects. Um, I, I don't know, it just kind of it put me off. I, I know the uh, uh, you know ILM worked on the uh, the '97 movie. Um, I, d- did they work on like what you know? I, I I don't know. I don't know the answer. I guess I should should have done my due diligence, but like I don't know the answer. Did they work on this one? I would assume not. Just because of like, yeah, like you said, the janky uh, cobbling together of practical and digital effects for this thing. Yeah, I didn't see the company's name in the credits, so probably not. Probably um, just outsourced it to some rando. Probably trying to work on a lower budget, and it shows, unfortunately. Or maybe fortunately, because people kind of like watching bad movies or bad looking movies sometimes. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the Chupacabra is chasing him like through the streets of Chandler, Arizona. Like, you know, it's smashing cars. And then like th- this chase sequence goes on for quite a while before he d- turns around. And like he he ends up on like some person's lawn and they have like a 
hose and he just turns on the hose and sticks it on the chupacabra and it like runs away for the time being it's not the last we see of it though (laughs) unfortunately (laughs) (laughs) lurking in the shadows um like right next to the house for some reason which is kind of weird is agent k uh performed by (laughs) played by clint eastwood um and he's like really impressed with how jay was able to like hold his own against this thing with a mere lawn hose i suppose hey that rhymed um yeah yeah he he is and uh you know i've I've never either in fiction or in real life never seen someone offered a job so fast yeah, I I mean, that's kind of what we wish, right? That we would have to go through all the interviews and it would just be that easy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, all you have to do is just put a chupacabra in its place and you're hired. Yeah, definitely. Strangely enough, I think probably, I don't know if this was like an intentionally funny moment or not, but like where it just hard cuts to uh to Jay doing desk work. <laughs> Like, you can see just how miserable he is, like, doing all that stuff. And he's like, Mm -hmm. is this really what I signed up for? (laughs) Well, he he gets his chance. He gets his time in the sun. He gets his chance to shine. His time in the limelight, so to speak. His his moment in the spotlight. His his chance to show his stuff. If you get what I'm saying. (laughs) Yeah, I I think I hear what you're (laughs) putting down low. Yeah, he's he, you get the impression that he has begged um K relentlessly to go out in the field and that you know what we kind of see is is K finally giving in. Yeah, like it, it's kind of like this long running thing for like a scene or two like he keeps begging or whatever and then uh he finally relents and says that he's ready and so it takes him to like the underground level and that's where we see like these labs with these different creatures like some of them are just chilling but the more threatening ones are like in cells and whatnot like there are vampires and even like some demons it's like really weird right it kind of reminded me of the uh, torchwood you know basement or containment area you know if you've if uh, if you've watched torchwood Oh uh, yes, yeah. the Doctor Who spinoff covered by Trister Doctor, uh, Doctor Who podcast. Check that out. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't gonna say it, but uh, I guess I didn't have to. <laughs> Thanks. <Yeah. laughs> uh, I actually just like earlier finished watching the other Doctor Who spinoff class, and it's honestly my favorite Doctor Who TV spinoff now, which is really disappointing that it got canceled. Like. I was, like, really into it. I even listened to the audios. Oh, dang. Yeah, I think I got, got canceled in, like, what, 2015? I think it was only one season. Um, It might have been 2017. Okay, so it aired in 2016, and... And then it just got yeah. canned. Yeah, canned like tuna. Canned like pineapple, honestly, you know? Oh, uh, yes. That comes into the... play here. Yeah, the, 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 the best topping for pizza. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Just bringing that back. <laughs> <laughs> like we were mentioning, um, K, yeah, see, I'm already getting the mixed up. K finally gives Jay a chance to go out in the field. Um, <laughs> and he's won over. He's convinced, bribed by a can of pineapples. You know, I, I you know just sliced uh, in, in their own juices, I guess you could say. Yeah, they've got like the Dole brand on them. Right. So. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a little bit of product placement in the movie. A little bit of product placement. A little Wayne's World esque. You know, just kind of pointing at the camera <laughs> and smiling. <laughs> yeah, I actually rewatched Wayne's World for its like 30th anniversary recently. <laughs> oh damn. Apparently it came out on Valentine's Day, so that's how I spent that evening. But yeah, I love that product placement scene in that movie. That's another movie that I like. I don't remember anything about. (laughs) I've watched it, but I I couldn't tell you what it was about for the life of me. Uh, It's aged pretty well. Um, Right now it's like free to watch on YouTube. Like 
you, you know, sometimes YouTube will have its own movie section and it'll say which ones are free with ads. Um, and that's one of them at the moment. Right. And which, I think the know, just, second one as well. Right. Just, just, you know, just turn your ad blocker on and it's just free without <laughs> ads. <you know? laughs> um, so yeah, Clint Eastwood is really enjoying this pineapple but i saw like some behind the scenes clips where he was getting really tired of like having to eat this pineapple like take after take to the point where he got like really sick of it and i I just saw like knowing that while watching the scene in the movie made it even funnier i I know and that was kind of like a i know it's not technically like a reference because it's a real world occurrence but like it kind of was almost a meta reference to like how when Clint Eastwood was working on the Dollars trilogy, like he's he's not a smoker, yet he was forced to smoke for those movies. Maybe I knew about it when you guys talked about it in Triple Play. I don't know, it's been forever. But I recently tried watching the Dollars trilogy. I was gonna watch it in reverse release order, because apparently that's the supposed chronological order. But I got yeah, like if you want to believe that, yeah, sure. Yeah, um, and I I got like half an hour into The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, and I thought to myself, I can't focus on this right now, I'm doing other stuff, so I just want to put something else on, and so that's, I haven't picked up that trilogy since then. Mm-hmm. But yeah, yeah. so they, they refer to Agent K, uh, this is like a little reference to that trilogy, I guess, they call him a dull or because, you know, it's a dull brand, and, you know, dollar trilogy, so... Mm-hmm. Yep. I also wonder if, like, if it was, like, you know, Agent K and then, like, Clint. I know Clint is with a C, but, like, obviously. But but still, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Just throwing that out there. Yeah, throwing out that conspiracy theory. <laughs> I mean, all I know is that my favorite Clint Eastwood movie is Back to the Future Part 3. <laughs> what do you think about, like, the... uh I guess, because we're kind of getting into this part of the movie. Like, what did you think about the setting, especially as compared to the 1997 movie where, you know, if you remember the 1997 one, it was more, it was above ground. It was New York City. Um, I think it was, (laughs) if I remember correctly. No, Um, yeah, it it was in New York. Yeah, because I think Barry Sonnenfeld, Sonnenfeld, um, I kind of get his name mixed up with Bernice Summerfield from the Doctor Who Expanded Universe, but anyway... Um, he he wanted he thought that New York would be a really good idea for like because it's such a mixed place and so having alien refugees like to him it felt like it made sense um, it made for a nice set piece I guess but here it's like I kind of get Space Jam vibes like just knowing that because you know when they get when the aliens in that movie go to Looney Tune Land they have to go underground to get there and so i kind of wonder if maybe there's like an influence from here to there or if it's just a coincidence yeah there, there's a lot of little things with this movie where it's like both behind both the behind the scenes stuff and the in front of the scenes stuff where it's like you know you kind of go like hey is this like a you know is this a, sort of a, a sly nod to something else or is it just you know and that's throughout the movie, really. It's sort of it's just composed of these little moments that that may or may not be, you know, uh, threads, I guess, c- connecting to uh, other things. Yeah, it's like some sort of web made of tape or something. Yeah, yellow tape t- cordoning off uh, alien, uh, <laughs> I guess, crime scenes or because uh, <laughs> because they were. I mean, we talk about like the more. Uh, I don't know, earthbound supernatural stuff, but there were alien influences in this movie. Yeah, like in the lab, they talk about how they detect some UFOs in the sky. Um, Right, obviously a reference to Jerry Anderson's UFO, on which uh, many of the characters pronounce UFO as UFO for some reason. Yeah. Yeah, like, just before uh, getting on this podcast, I was actually watching another episode of UFO, uh, The Man Who Came Back, or whatever the episode was called. I'm almost finished with the show, actually. Oh, really? Wow. That was, uh, that's quick. Yeah, I'm, I'm like, enjoying it more than I thought I would. Check out Inevitable, a classic <laughs> sci-fi podcast since talking about UFO. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
yeah, some of the episodes are more. Are, it's it's a hit and miss show for me so far, but we don't need to go into that. But yeah, there are alien influences in this, and like, what'd you think of some of the alien designs that we were able to get glimpses of? Yeah, well, it's interesting. I mean, at this point, you know, it's very clear that like they know what they're working with. Um, where it's like you won't, you're you're getting little flashes of the more complex aliens. You're not ever shown like one full on really. You're sort of, um, it's almost done like you might expect in like a horror movie or something, where you kind of get just little flashes of what the aliens might look like type thing. There is that one moment where a- Agent J uh, thinks that he found uh, fruit roll ups on a table. And he, like, starts eating it, and then it turns out that it's actually the tongue of an alien. And it's like, don't worry, I'll grow it back. And he, like, after he swallows, he has to, like, go to the toilet and, like, throw... Like, we don't see the vomit, but you hear, like, the, the noises or whatever. Like, he he's, like, so traumatized by that, and it's, like, really gross when you think about it. Right. Yeah, I mean, better than having, I don't know, like, a potential... Uh like sentient tongue chest burster style like just rip out of your stomach or something like that yeah there should be a movie about something like that but alas yeah they could even you know they they could even go ham in this potential movie with with actual fruit roll-ups product placement agent j and agent k are being briefed about some sketchy activity in the grand canyon and they're not really sure what to expect there and in my head like you know the last time I was seeing this and brushing up on like what happens like I was trying to figure out like what it was because you know the chupacabra is introduced early on so it's like oh is it gonna be that again but what did you think of what it ended up being what just like the grand scheme behind this like yeah the grand scheme of the grand canyon I guess you could say (laughs) oh god well you know I wasn't expecting sort of a Maybe this actually this is completely my fault, but I don't know why. But I wasn't expecting like uh, the the almost conspiracy theory vibe of this. Now, granted, it's funny, right? Men in Black is you know leans towards comedy for sure, but like just the entire like underground society linking various canyons and trenches throughout the world, such as the the you know the Mariana Trench obviously plays a huge part in the finale of the movie, but like yeah, just the society of cryptids living underground yeah it kind of has like i don't know if this is what they were going for because it's not explained very well but whenever it it shows them going really very deep into these places like it kind of feels like they teleport from one place to another so like from one canyon to another place and it kind of gives it that very unsettling supernatural vibe at times, um, even if the comedy is sometimes at odds with that. Yeah, the cinematography, I think, definitely achieves that effect pretty well, right? Where there's sort of, there's not much contiguity in a way. And you kind of look at something like that and you go like, oh, well, you know, whatever, it's just just poor, you know, uh, filmmaking or something like that. But like, yeah, it, regardless, it lends it sort of this, uh, I don't know, like uh, <laughs> almost like, x-files vibe or something like that where you're kind of just you're put off a little bit you know yeah or twin peaks something like that yeah really eerie like like they even talk about how if you go through these mysterious entrances or portals or whatever they call them it uh, they said that you can emerge the other side a changed person and this is where they basically write in how Chris O'Donnell becomes David Schwimmer for a good chunk of the movie. When, when he comes out, they, they're they like, whoa, you look like a completely different person. And he's like, what? And he like looks in a mirror and is like, oh, no. And it's like, it, it's really funny because it's David Schwimmer. And it makes it even funnier that like Chandler, Arizona is a location because like he was on Friends and Chandler was on Friends. Um, I don't know if he caught that, but I thought that was I, funny. Yeah, and I, I didn't actually. But, you know, it's another one of those little things where it's like how much of this movie script was decided not by like a traditional, I don't know, um, 
ideation, traditional, you know, writer's room stuff, traditional storytelling, but just like how many ref, how, like what story can we compose? And it's just references crammed together. Right. Yeah. And this was like very early on in like friends being a thing. So I'm betting that Schwimmer probably like gave some notes and was saying, Hey, this will be pretty funny sort of cross promote or whatever. Yeah. And you know, you can't fault them. They were on the cutting edge. Yeah. But speaking of cutting edge, it was the really thrilling sequence when, you know, they go to the one of these other canyons where there are rock formations that look like sharp edges of knife blades and they're kind of sentient and it's like, whoa, are these things trying to kill us? And it's like, uh, I thought there was some really good practical effects in this sequence when they could have just gone like CGI and made it look all gross. Sure. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. I can see that, yeah. I I wasn't coming into this planning on saying anything good about how this movie looked, effects-wise, I guess. I I guess we kind of praised the cinematography in a way, the effects-wise. But uh, yeah, yeah, I can kind of give them that, I guess. Yeah, I mean, much of the effects are kind of mad, but this is like one of those little instances where I was like, oh, that was actually all right. Mm Mm-hmm. Another thing I find weird about this movie is that we don't really get any backstory for Agent K or Agent J until, like, halfway through when they, like, finally sit down at some coffee shop and, like, talk to each other. And uh, Agent K is like, oh, I I used to want to play baseball. I was, like, a coach for a little league, but I want to be in the big league. It was kind of odd that it took so long for that type of stuff to come up. Yeah, and it it just goes to show you, like, this was maybe one of the more realistic parts of the movie, I think, where, like, you know, K, I mean, I guess if everyone watching the movie probably already knows this, but, like, K, you know, he, he explains how he basically sprained his ankle for life, and, uh, and, uh, (laughs) You know, he just, he had to take his, his, uh, he couldn't go, because of that, he couldn't go down the path that he wanted to in life. So he had to, he had to take his second, uh, I guess, choice of, uh, of being a MIB agent or or a man in black, I guess, you know. And, uh, yeah, yeah, Uh, you know, just, it kind of, it hits home, right? Where it's like, you know, sometimes you don't get your uh, first choice of a life. Yeah, it hits a home run. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's just like, you know, sometimes, you know, you have these goals in life, right? Like, and and Jay comes right out and he, he says this. I mean, like, uh, well, let's not beat around the bush. He 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 uh, he empathizes with Kay, sympathizes with him. He's uh, he's sort of on his side, and this is how the two kind of this is where they really start, I guess, forming their bond. Because right, they're kind of they're ambivalent towards each other up to this point, and they're kind of you're not each other's throats a little bit. But like Jay just comes in, and he's just like, you know, for, at first I wanted to be a, a teacher, but I wasn't able to, so I just became an astronaut instead. <laughs> and uh, and you know that's how they kind of they bond over this shared experience of not being able to f- fulfill their uh their dreams yeah it was really a strange reveal finding out that he's like this washed up astronaut at like a younger age than one would think it's yeah it made for a really weird but i guess somewhat memorable until you forget it choice (laughs) yeah that's the men in black series described as a whole somewhat memorable until you forget it yeah like (laughs) but I mean, it made sense. Like he was so accepting of uh, it, it put the beginning of the movie, I think, into perspective because like he it did feel like pretty quick how how accepting he was of all of this and how how ready he was to accept aliens and other supernatural things. And then you realize, OK, he was sort of branded as a conspiracy theorist by NASA and that's why he was ousted. Uh, but turns out he was right. Yeah, he he, he even talked about how. He wanted to go to space to see aliens and was disappointed that there weren't any on the moon, at least as far as he could tell. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, Kay tells him, oh, the aliens on the moon, they're just really good at camouflaging. Y'all didn't look hard enough. 
Right, right. Plus, you know, you have your you have your micro uh, animals and all this, like tardigrades and other yeah. microorganisms. Yeah. Yeah, like they mentioned, the shrinks. Like there are these um, tardigrades that can grow to like normal animal size, but also shrink to microscopic size. Yeah, freaking terrifying, by the way. Just yeah. Like... <laughs> <laughs> that goopy CGI. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just Nickelodeon sliming everywhere. It was a sight to behold. On some previous episode of Delayed Replay, I linked the recipe for Nickelodeon slime that I found online, so I guess I'll put that in the show notes for this one, too, I guess. I'm kind of morbidly curious, like, what what did that recipe entail? I think there's, like, syrup or something in it. Let me see. Yeah, there has to be. Nickelodeon slime recipe. I mean, there has to be like some kind of emulsifier in it, you know. Like, uh, I mean, it just, I, I'm, I'm just so cute. Like, what could it possibly be? Like, according to this article I found, it says two cups of oatmeal, three cups of applesauce, four cups of vanilla pudding, three to four drops of green food coloring. Oh, dang! So it's edible. Yeah, so another thing for cooking with Chester Doctor to cover. <laughs> yeah, I guess eventually. <laughs> I had no idea that it was edible. I mean, it, was, it looks <laughs> it looks like so toxic. It looks like you have you let a single drop of it get into inside your body and you're you're done for. I mean, I guess it has to be edible if you're gonna dump it on people, right? Like it has to be safe. <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it, 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 isn't that why rain is edible? Rain? Like an actual occurrence? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know why that was so funny, but uh, but it was. Yeah, the world will never know why, but anyway. They have this bonding moment, and it's like one of those things that makes me kind of care a bit more about them. It's also weird that this bonding moment comes, like, after Agent K's, uh, no, not Agent K, Agent J's face uh, got changed, as we mentioned earlier. Like, it's kind of weird, like, the timing of that. So it, it's like you kind of have to do mental gymnastics to believe that Chris O'Connell and David Schwimmer are playing the same character, because I, I sometimes felt like their mannerisms were off. Well, he was a changed man, you know, as they say multiple times. I thought it would work as like sort of a good visual metaphor for like, you know, he had this um, n- not dark past, but he had this past that he wasn't proud of, you know, being a failed astronaut and then just basically a wash up in life. And so this is his chance at a, a refresh, so to speak. Yeah, I guess it also doubles as a metaphor for how really opening your eyes and seeing all the paranormal stuff in the universe rather than like pretending it's not there. It can really change someone who actually pays attention to all the weird out of this world stuff or like supernatural stuff that's going on even. Right. Right. And that's sort of, I guess, kind of the big thematic high note that this movie like really, I guess, kind of tries to hit and mostly succeeds. I think, I, I guess. Yeah, I, I will say that David Schwimmer does have really good physical comedy. Like, he makes these, like, funny hand gestures, like, at certain points. It's It kind of, like, cracks, cracks me up seeing, like, how, like, like, I don't know. It's just the way he moves. It just, like, has certain good comedic timing sometimes. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can see that. I can see that. I get where you're coming from. They get briefed about how like the chupacabra is back but it's gone to with, the oh go with ahead. a vengeance no i was just gonna say with a vengeance yeah yeah and like they end up having to chase it through like all these different locations that what you know the canyons and stuff to the point where they eventually end up at the mariana trench and of course like they have like their own scuba gear and whatnot yeah it was fun you know seeing them kind of a with the flippers and all this and you know the wetsuits kind of a it brought I, I guess most people wouldn't experience this but it brought me back to like watching classic doctor who and and uh which i you know spent a good deal of time watching and 
and the Vord, right? Sort of these uh, wetsuit wearing alien creatures. Yeah, it definitely felt like early classic Doctor Who in that, like, this sequence, like, when they got there, was in black and white. So I guess to add to the eeriness of it. Right, and just kind of the otherworldliness, too. They're kind of going down into this underwater world, right? And they say, like, uh, yeah, I think they even mentioned it in the movie, where it's like, we know more about outer space than we do about, like, the depths of the ocean. And so they're sort of going into this this unknown realm, really, and, you know, anything could be down there. Um, and as it turns out, <laughs> it's a secret society of cryptids, you know, sort of roused, rallied uh, uh, under one banner by this chupacabra freaking thing. Yeah, I think they were also trying to imply that the Loch Ness monster is there as well somehow. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and mm, yeah, you get a little bit of Nessie there. Mm-hmm. Good, good old Nessie. You really think about it with the ocean, like there really is a lot that we don't think about is down there like lots of scary stuff it's like i know james cameron has an affinity for going way down there but it's like i would never like put myself very deep down in the ocean i i just prefer it just at the beach and that's it yeah i don't even like that just, <laughs> just stay away <laughs> from uh <laughs> from the oceans in general yeah they're trying to like document this stuff like with their waterproof cameras which they they get caught to like a few minutes into this and like the creatures start going after them and it makes for this sequence where they're trying to swim away and then they have to like try to figure out how to like attack or capture these creatures and it's a ver- there are moments where it was hard for me to see who was where on the screen because you know it's black and white and it's really dark underwater so it was just kind of confusing to me oh yeah it was a visual mess like let's not beat around the book <laughs> visually a mess. but at the same time like i was getting so into the movie at this point and you know i, I know we've kind of railed into it we kind of uh, bashed the movie so far but like you know i, I can't lie like uh, I, I was into it at this point i was like i was invested i yeah. was at the like kind of you know the lean forward a little bit hand on mouth like type thing like all right where is this going (laughs) yeah and the hand is full of popcorn you're just shoving into (laughs) your mouth yeah no no i I wouldn't be caught dead uh uh eating while watching a movie (laughs) mostly because you can't eat when you're dead but (laughs) as far as i know but Say that to the zombies who appear in this sequence. <laughs> I know, yeah, the underwater zombie. God, it's disgusting. Just bloated, just disgusting. Yeah, it's like water. soggy flesh. Yeah. It's just really weird. And, and, like, they were still able to keep this, like, PG-13 somehow, even then. <laughs> yeah, they only threw in one F-bomb, too. I mean, obviously, because you can only do... Well, I think it's it's either one or two and to keep it PG-13. I'm not sure. Yeah, I think it's one. Which. Yeah, it's one. They have one chance. They threw it in at the worst possible moment right at the end. Oh, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. <laughs> they they have, like, these... Oh, what was that? Uh, I think it was just, like, a, a bike outside. Oh, okay. It might, might have been a trike, actually, with a... No, I'm kidding. It's a motorcycle, <laughs> obviously. Oh, okay. That's the sound that, like, one of these, like, underwater creatures was making, and it's like, whoa, it's like bigger than a whale it's kind of like that phantom menace there's always a bigger fish type of thing yeah no we don't even get an explanation for what this thing is or where it came from or or anything but yeah it is it's bigger than a blue whale probably the largest creature in the sea like they wreck shop it just yeah yeah it basically just wrecks everything and they they don't even like try to figure out like what it is they just like get up and go because they know that they don't stand a chance against this thing right it basically just ends the chupacabra uprising in one fell swoop k and j are just like well guess that's our job done yeah (laughs) yeah it's just such an easy solution to this thing it's like what (laughs) (laughs) it's basically like when someone's playing Monopoly and they get so frustrated that they just wipe everything off the board and are like, oh, game over. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's more like two people are playing Monopoly and like a third person comes in and wipes everything off the board. 
Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's literally the it's literally the definition of writing yourself into a corner. And just, yeah, <laughs> and just like I don't know, fan fiction style, just wiping everything at the end. But hey, it's a good microcosm of what Men in Black is. Just wiping everything. Yeah. At the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So they get back to the base. Like, like it, it, it's a cut. What? Like, okay, it wipes everything away and everything's, like, pretty much done. And then it does a cut to the base and it's a color again. And they both look at each other and, like, that was weird. <laughs> and it's, like, yeah, that, that was kind of a weird cut. But, yeah, what what did you think of how things were, like, wrapping up and how the F-bomb came into play? <laughs> well, I wasn't expecting it to be the final word of the movie. That's That's all I can say. They're basically just eating sandwiches, and Agent J, who still looks like David Schwimmer, like, I, I guess this is his life now. He just looks like David Schwimmer from now on. <laughs> uh, David Schwimmer, who was a swimmer in the ocean just mm -hmm. a bit ago. Um, he basically um, gets his sack lunch from the fridge, and, like, he eats one sandwich, but he's like, where's my extra? And he, like, keeps digging for it. And he's like, did someone take my sandwich? My effing sandwich? And then it cuts to credits. Right. <laughs> well, I mean, I kind of, I like the um, the sort of, uh, I don't want to call it meta, but like, yeah, almost meta thing where it's like, K obviously, his cover blown has to erase Jay's memory. And so like the final thing of the movie, right, is that you are getting your memory erased, just like Jay. Yeah, I, I also found it interesting how the music for this movie was the exact same music that Danny Elfman would provide for the 1997 one. Like, I guess because they knew people would forget, they just copied and pasted the music and inserted it into the 1997 one. Right. Yeah, why go through all the extra work type thing? That was like a interesting experience i guess <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i think that's how i would probably want to describe it too is yeah an interesting experience maybe not a maybe not a, a good or even decent movie but just an interesting experience right do you have any other thoughts about it before we do like closing thoughts and score out of 10 um, you know, I, I don't think so. I mean, probably whatever thoughts I had were memory erased at the end of the movie, <laughs> other than what we already talked about. But like, yeah, yeah, I think I guess we covered everything pretty decently. So. All right. So what are your final thoughts and score out of 10 for The Men in Black? Well, my final thoughts, like I just said, what I remember, you know, of, of my uh, thoughts. It was definitely an experience. I don't know if I'd call it a good movie, although, like I said, I have to admit that at some level I did like it um, because of, you know, what I said before, right, getting it, getting kind of into it at the end and just kind of being invested in this final scene and everything like this. And so, you know, I, I generally, I guess I'm walking away with this with the idea that it's, you know, pretty middle of the road, pretty mediocre, which is why I'm going to give it a 10 memory erasing devices out of 10 or something like that. <laughs> you know just a pretty average middle of the line movie. 10 out of 10 is middle of the road for you <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah all right <laughs> i definitely agree that it is middle of the road um but my score would be different for some reason yeah it's an odd movie kind of a a guilty pleasure, I guess. Uh, probably fun to watch with friends just to see how wacky it gets. But yeah, I would give this one um, a six out of 10 fruit roll ups. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just I, I, I get that because, you know, you eat six fruit roll ups and you're like, oh God, why did I do that? <laughs> kind of, you come out of Men in Black, you know? It's just like, it was, parts of it were good, but you're like, all right, I didn't really need to do that. Yeah, I guess that means that one fruit roll-up is the best, because it's like you eat one, and you're like, oh, that was good, and just move on. Yeah. 
yeah, your, your teeth or your tongue's blue. You've got <laughs> half, half the thing is still stuck in your teeth, but you're like, yeah, yeah, let's just move on with life. Yeah, you throw away the rolled up paper thing. Um, I guess you look at the pictures on it first and then throw it away because let's be real, who's going to keep that? <laughs> a side eye is my collection. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I guess that'll do it. Thanks again for being on this episode, Keon. Where can people find your stuff? Thanks again for, for having me on, Stephen. Um, we kind of, <laughs> Stephen, I guess, mostly plugged uh, other things that I am on slash do throughout the episode. But yeah, um, I and Dylan, another friend of the show who's, who's probably, who you've probably heard um, before on this show, uh, do a couple podcasts. Right now, our current ones are Trust Your Doctor, a Doctor Who podcast, and Inevitable, a classic sci-fi podcast. So you can find those on whatever podcasting platform you want. Our Doctor Who one is on hiatus, but we're watching the uh, the 1970 series UFO for our, uh, for Inevitable at the moment. So yeah, if you want to check that out, feel free. Yeah, I think the only one I didn't plug was Zenith, a Blake Seven podcast, which and now you have. So thank you, Stephen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I yeah, just that's... started listening to that now that I finished Blake Seven. So yeah, yeah, you finished Blake Seven like hella quick. <laughs> yeah, well, I got the seven-day free trial on BritBox, and I had to, like, force myself to watch all 52 episodes within that period. Damn, that's really <laughs> quick. Oh, my God. Probably not the best idea. Um... <laughs> <laughs> I want to know what you think, but, like, we can end the episode if you don't want to drag uh, it out too long. Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I, I sent you guys an email, so maybe you guys will read it on there. Okay. Yeah, give listeners here an incentive to check that out on Inevitable. As for my plugs, people can follow me at Steven Schinder on Instagram and Twitter, Steven Schinder Storytelling on Facebook. You can get my fantasy horror comedy novel, Lemons and Muck Rain. It's on Amazon. More info at stevenschinder.com. And more news to come in the near future about the next book, Trespassing Through the Visages. If you want to write this podcast, you can email delayedreplaypodcast at gmail.com. Let us know your thoughts on paranormal stuff, I guess. And you can also find me on Yes Shift. It's a podcast I do with my dad where we talk about the band Yes. We've interviewed people like Adam Sears from the band Will Bait Scarb, Mike Tiano, who's been associated with uh, Yes before have an interview with former Yes keyboardist Oliver Wakeman coming up in late March, so that'll be lots of fun. You can also check out Mr. Multiverse's Patreon. Uh, you may remember him from previous episodes on the show. Uh, he and I recently, uh, he had me on his new show called The Requalizers, where uh, basically talk about like what would a requal to a classic movie do today be like like if it was a sequel that ignored everything except for the first movie so we talked about jaws and that was fun yeah thanks again keon uh really appreciate having you on again thanks again steven really appreciate you inviting me on again yeah next episode will be minecraft the movie just in case you listeners are curious um yeah so without further delay have a good day Prince of Bel Air was like mostly autobiographical to Will Smith's, or or biographical rather, to Will Smith's life. Like I had no idea. Oh yeah, um, some of it is, I guess, it's inspired by his experiences, but I'm sure there's like a lot of fictionality to it. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. The the first season of Fresh Prince was definitely my favorite because I feel like it tried the most at trying to say something about issues that were going on and are unfortunately still going on the I'm, show actually got rebooted recently like first few <laughs> episodes are out <laughs> it's a drama now instead of a sitcom but my friend whose opinion i trust says it's really good so i i've been meaning to check it out i just haven't yet yeah that actually doesn't surprise me yeah it's bel-air it's just called bel-air yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
it premiered like last week actually like last sunday or something yeah 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 the next episode should be coming out tomorrow <laughs> unless they put them all out at once i don't know well i think it premiered on sunday and then they said the episodes from here on out will be out on thursdays i don't know they came out it's three episodes came out last sunday yeah and then episode four came out like two days ago well i'm not gonna watch that <laughs> <laughs> Right, because even... it's it's not sci-fi. That's why. Yeah, exactly. It's not quite. It's not British sci-fi from the seventies, <laughs> <laughs> so I can't watch it. <laughs> I'm I'm legally uh, barred from watching it. Um, I, I was never. I never even was a big fan of the the original. Like I never. I just watched random episodes on TV. Like I never actually sat down and watched it per season. You know. Oh, yeah. I mean, I loved it when um I watched reruns in Random Order some years ago, yeah. but then uh, like this was like a year and a half ago, almost. I decided to watch the whole thing since it was all on HBO Max, and yeah, so I watched it from beginning to end, and it's pretty mm-hmm. good. But but like I said, the first season was the best one. I mean, oh, damn. It's like 150 episodes. <laughs> Man, they just made this continuously for, like, six years. <laughs> I mean, it, it gets pretty meta. Like, sometimes they break the fourth wall and point out <laughs> that the actress for the mother is different in the later seasons. Wow. <laughs> or, or, like, there's one character named Jazz who points it out, and everyone, like, tr- just ignores him. And, or Will will, like, look at the camera, and then they'll just move on. Wow. Maybe I'll put some of these as outtakes or something. I don't know, but... <laughs>